Do you realize there's a whole kingdom that's real? It's a spiritual kingdom. It's got angels in it. They walk to and fro here on the face of the earth. There's windows, which means that we can see into the heavenlies. There's doors into the heavenlies. There's angels going back and forth all the time into the great city where our God is and where Jesus is making a place for us. All these things are real, and it says that our paradigm, where we're at, is fading away, and we will come into that reality. Well, why don't we take time to try to come into that reality now instead of waiting for then? Jesus lived in that reality. When we look at the early church, they lived in that reality. It was a reality to them. It was not something that was a facade waiting to happen in the future. They somehow had broken through in the spirit and understood what it was like to live in that domain here. Why? Because this is the Lord's footstool. That means he puts his feet on it. That means he's here. He comes and he goes. He's God. He can do as he please. But be mindful of trying to connect your mind into the reality of God, which does exist even now as I speak. So as we pray, ask Him to open your eyes of your heart and open your understanding and your expectation and your hope of sensing Him. Is our sensors that are deadened, what mountain is there that He could hide behind? What planet or what universe is there that can stop his voice from being heard? So the problem is our ears. But if we pray and ask the Lord, will you please speak to me in the midst of your great word, he can break through our difficulty. Shall we pray? Lord, how great and gracious you are to surround us with such a host, a host that wants to help us, Help us to know you. Help us to draw near to you. Help us to learn to walk with you and be conformed to your image. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for making such things possible and the reality of your kingdom possible. So I ask you to touch us by the power of your spirit and illuminate yourself to us in a spiritual reality it becomes real for us here so that life with you becomes experiential. Breathe life into the Word that it might conjoin itself to us, that we would have eyes that would be able to sense and hear you in the midst of your great Word. In Jesus' great and powerful and precious name I pray, amen, amen. In our last session, we were dealing with the law, and I think it's apropos that we continue on because what we were doing is a parallel of the difference between law and grace. Because with the law, it's a set of religious rules. Those rules can be extracted from Scripture. They can be extracted from the Mosaic law, they can be extracted from civil law, they can be extracted from the Gentiles, they can be extracted from the Jews. But if we're just living under a set of external laws for our righteousness, the scripture says that the external laws could never bring us into righteousness. They could never bring us into righteousness. We could keep them for all of our lives and they still would not bring us into righteousness. Why? Because what man had in the garden was something that was inside that was righteous. The breath of God, the imprint of his image of God. God is wholly righteous. Not only was he made with that imprint, but he had the, the image of God imprinted upon him too. So everything, his external, his internal, and his breath was righteous because all of it looked like, acted like, was inspired and fully filled with God. Adam was truly the first righteous man. God made him that way. He was made in perfect righteousness. And of course, we, in our last session, talked 
how he fell and went through some of those things about the law. And our intent is not to dwell on the law, but the problem is the law, what it was formed for, for us, was to point out our unrighteousness, to point the way that we need Jesus who can give us righteousness. Now, we've discussed those things in our, our last session. We looked at if you're going to live under the law of Moses, which there are some Christians that, oh, well, we need to keep this holiday. We need to practice the Passover. We need to do this. And I've been lawyered to death by those guys dropping by to tell me how we're doing it wrong under grace, that we need to get under the law, and that we're all headed to hell because we're not under the law. I've had them tell me that face-to-face, toe-to-toe, and they were doing it so nicely. You're going to hell! <laughs> you know, the, the real gift of love was there. <laughs> and you're kicking everybody away. You know, veins popping out of their neck. And I, oh, this is from God? <laughs> Where's the love? If we're under the law, we must keep all the law all the time. And it's impossible. God knew it was impossible even for the Jews. So he set up a sacrifice system, right? But they were the ones that... We're basically, man is always basically just saying, give me the rules and get out of my face. (laughs) Right? Even our kids. Just tell me what you want and let me do it my way. Now, I didn't want to hear back there. uh, Our unrighteousness is due to our independent sin is just independence from God. It's not necessarily immorality. It's not necessarily wickedness. It's not necessarily doing evil things. Sin is encapsulated of, I want my independence. That's where sin began. Man being told, the woman being told, you can be independent of God. You'll be like Him. You'll have the knowledge you need to make your own decisions. You won't have to listen to Him. You'll know the difference between good and evil. And you can be independent of him. So sin is us being independent in our decisions, in our purposes, in our actions, in the outcome, in in everything that we plan in life. If we have planned something without God, it is God-less. Therefore, what is it? It's through our independence, it's sin, because God's not in it. doesn't mean it has to be evil. If God's not in it, it's sin. Now, What do we do with that? Because the law points at our sin and says we're guilty, and then the enemy comes along and says, I agree with the law, you're very guilty. (laughs) Right? And we go, oh, and we just like a wounded fish in the water, just barely breathing, you know, floating upside down, can't get the world right, because we feel condemned. So if God made a way for the Jews who had no righteousness to become externally righteous, but not internally, through the sacrifice system. It wasn't through them keeping the law, right? Because they failed at that. So he made another way for external righteousness, and that was through the sacrifices. So that was God making a way, knowing that, okay, guys, I'll put that out there for you, and I guess we'll use that in the annuals of history so that when all men stand before me, uh, you know, the kids who wanted to be rotten and wanted their independence... They'll be telling me, why didn't you just give us a set of rules? And I'm just going to throw that law out there. There it was. And you wouldn't keep it. You didn't want to. It's impossible to keep the law because the flesh, the rebel man, hates the law. And every time the law is mentioned, we get our, okay, I'll force myself to do that. But that's like that kid on the pew, you know, I'm... Yeah, the parents shove him down, sit down and stay down. And the little kid, four year old, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up inside. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's the rebel that's within us. And so we must digress, I guess you would call it that, to, to look at those things, because part of our problem is our shame, our failure, and our belief that somehow maybe we're just not getting it and not living up to it and that we're so guilty 
We're so guilty that it's difficult to go in and be with God when he's waiting behind the curtain, right? He's waiting. But I know I'm disqualified. So if he made a way for the Jews, then hasn't he also made a way for us? And that's what grace is that we're going to be looking at. His way that he has made for us. If there's guilt, it's because the enemy is involved. If Jesus took my guilt completely in himself to the point that God spit in his face, and the enemy comes to me and says, you're guilty, but yet Jesus took it and says, I took it. If I accept the guilt, am I believing what the enemy says rather than what Jesus Christ says and what Jesus did? So there's this problem of our faith, of what he has accomplished in our lives. What he accomplished in his coming. What he accomplished. Now, if we had a big beefy cow that we could go in and butcher and watch it slaughter and scream and holler and blood and guts flying everywhere, you'd, okay, surely I'm atoned for now, you know. There's a dead animal. I'm atoned for. And, I, and okay, yeah, Satan, I'm atoned for. But there was something far, far more horrific than that, and it was... Uh, The prince, the king of the universe, offered his life, and it was far worse than a cow being slaughtered or a sheep being slaughtered. It was beaten to death first. It was scourged. It was spit upon. It was, and 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 you know that story. So grace is something that is freely given by God alone, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, to those who are repentant. That means, Lord, I don't want to do that. Now, you may not have the power to stop doing that, but it means that you're a sheep that has fallen in the pig pen and you're screaming at the top of your lungs, Oh, God, I don't know how I got in here. I don't snort like them, do I? And after a while, we believe we snort like them because we smell like them. We got up on the fence and we were looking and and, and inquisitive and liked what was over there, we thought, but... The difference between a pig and a sheep is the sheep wants out. The sheep realizes it's dirty. The pig does not. The sheep realizes there's freedom. and The sheep realizes it needs a rescuer. The sheep realizes that there's someone that owns the farm that can really deal with this. And if I can get his attention, the sheep, a true sheep, is interested in calling to the shepherd. Not to other sheep, to the shepherd, because the sheep cannot help it out of the pig pen. The sheep will always call and bay, bay, and bay, because if they've been around the great shepherd, they know he's the answer. He's the one that will cuddle them. He's the one that will wash them. He's the one that healed them when they had a broken leg. He's the one that spoke softly to them when they were going through some traumatic trials in their life. So a sheep will recognize the voice of a shepherd and want out. Now, the reason I'm giving you these depictions is because I'm assuming that you're sheep. To my knowledge, everyone sitting here is a sheep, a true sheep. But yet, there's many times that you go oink, (laughs) and you think, I oinked. I oinked, I know I oinked, (laughs) you know. And we go round and round with ourselves internally, thinking that we must be a pig because we went oink. Uh, We must look and see how Christ made a way for us. Do you believe he made a way? See, we, we say we do, but yet we're not up dancing and shouting hallelujah and praise God. So there must be something within us that doesn't either understand the equation, that doesn't understand how to apply it. We talked about last time in our last session that the law put a basic requirement up on us that we must come into righteousness, but we couldn't handle that. We couldn't accomplish that. So God made a way, and then we talked about that in grace... There is a way that God has made, but there's also, there's still requirements of the law, right? But yet we looked at the scripture that said Jesus fulfilled those requirements of the law to bring us into grace. 
so that we didn't have to fulfill the requirements of the law. Grace is something that's freely given, and here's part of the problem. We think if we go do a few things for God that now we're entitled to grace. That means that you're seeking grace based upon what you did rather than, Lord, you made the way and I stand amazed. You have supplied my forgiveness, my washing, my cleansing, and my rescue. So if I'm trying in my own flesh and think I deserve it, that, that's an error. And the enemy can really toy with your head because then when you don't deserve it, then you deserve to be called the pig and everything else that we are by our carnal nature, which we see, and we still do not accept God's testimony that he killed it on the cross. We don't accept his testimony. The Jews didn't accept the testimony. Do you realize that's what the law was, the stone tablets? They were kept in the ark with the lid on it, which was called the mercy seat, which that lid in the Greek, when the Hebrew was translated, it, the lid, the mercy seat was called a perpetuation of God. Did you realize that? Now, the reason I'm the reason I'm throwing that in there is because we're going to cover some scripture that talks about Jesus becoming the perpetuation for our sin. That mercy seat was also it was on top of the ark. It was a perpetuation for their sin. A blood was sprinkled on it, and you came. And God would meet with you, and He would sit on the mercy seat, and He'd say, "How you doing? I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm not against you. I'm your God. Thank you for." For coming. So he, he made the way for us to come, did he not? So he really desires for us to come, and he desires for us to come so he can help us through our conflicts, he can help us out of our, our misidentity. We have so much difficulty trying to find our identity because we're not accepting the identity of Christ within us. So we're looking to somehow supply that identity that we think we need, either by the way we dress or what we do or how we act or what we do for people or what we don't do for people. or We're looking for some form of identity that will bring relief to the central condition of our guilt. Right? We have a central condition of guilt. Or do we? See, inside we think we do. If I was sitting down and talk with every one of you, uh, you, 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 if you opened up, you're going to start confessing, uh, yeah, I'm guilty I'm not doing this. And you're either guilty of not doing something or you're guilty of doing something. <laughs> right? The enemy's got us from both directions. So if God knew that and Jesus knew that when he took on Project Curtis, then what is his provision? How do we get into this grace? Yeah, we know that there's grace, and we know we can't earn it, and we talked about the things, the seven things that Jesus did to fulfill the whole law for us. And one, he did all the requirements of prophecy. Do you realize there's prophecy for the children of God, too, that they're supposed to fulfill? You can't fulfill those except through the Spirit. There's prophecies in the Scripture about us becoming kings and priests unto our Lord. Right? There's prophecies of us being the bride of Christ. There's all kinds of prophecies. There's like 3,800 prophecies concerning what we're supposed to accomplish for God. And for him, there was far, far more than that for him to accomplish for his God. And he accomplished those. So, in keeping with his record, shouldn't we also be looking at forming the identity of him so that we can accomplish the will of God too? If we're guilty, we cannot. So we have to eliminate the factor of guilt, even though we're guilty, right? Uh, if you have a traffic fine, and they have you in jail, and they say you're guilty, and they say, and, and we lived in one of those third world countries, that uh, if you pass $1,000, not only will the ticket go away, but all records will go away, and the person never existed, and they've never been arrested, and you can take them home with you. <laughs> and... I come and I pay the thousand dollars and all the records are erased and you're no longer guilty. But yet, weren't you guilty when you did that? 
the guilt still remains, but the charges get dismissed, the condemnations are taken away, and you might have to have a little pep talk of, you know, it's not good to drive on the sidewalk doing 60. <laughs> because I meet many Christians driving on the sidewalk, <laughs> and their friends are on the sidewalk. <laughs> And their enemies are on the sidewalk. Now, that's real fun. <laughs> There's a reason to go on the sidewalk if your enemy's on the sidewalk, right? Okay, so Jesus fulfilled prophecies. We looked at that. We looked at he kept the complete law all the time, something we could not do. And the reason we need this in the back of our head, someone had to fulfill it, right? Jesus fulfilled all the things. He entered into a covenant with us, and I could go on and on about those things. He took our sin in himself. He hung it on the cross along with the law. He endured God's wrath. He opened the scroll. He sat down, and he took charge. Now, the purpose of the law, I've skirted some of the things about it. In our last session, I told you and gave you a list of ten different things. The purpose of the law. But the effects of the law means we're under a curse and we enter into slavery and we live under the dominion of Satan. There's the effects of the law. So the law itself is not evil, but the problem is our flesh is evil and cannot keep the law. And therefore we become even a greater rebel because, no, I'm not keeping it. Or we figure out our own principles of the way we can look like we're keeping it like, I love you, and we're spitting out foul things out of our heart and out of our mouth. I, I'm keeping the law on the external, but not on the internal. So we asked in our last session about what does God require if we're not under the law, and there was something that was startling that we found out. One, that the law is here for the purpose of pointing out what we need, how do we, the fulfillment of the law for us is stated in Romans 8 and 1 and 2. It says the righteous requirement of the law, that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us who do not walk according for the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Key number one, if we're going to come into grace, the only way of coming into it is learning to listen to what the Holy Spirit says. Uh, this morning I was practicing that, and I said, well, Lord, what should I have for breakfast? And he said, oatmeal. I said, okay. I put some on. I got it and put it in a bowl, and I love sweetener. I love sugar, but I don't eat sugar anymore, and I thought, well, sweetener, you know. I could put like six packs of sweetener on oatmeal, you know. No butter. I'm trying to be good. The Lord said, uh, no sweetener in your oatmeal. Yes, sir. I wonder what that tastes like. And I went in and tasted it. And I, wow, this is good, Lord. Just a, a simple thing to see if I would be obedient to that. Because later on, when I was, I made some iced tea, and I, I, did I put sweetener in this, Lord? He said, it's okay. You know, so, so it wasn't a thing of, okay, you do it every time. It was just, no, are you listening to me? Do you want to listen to me? In the small things. Uh, you, you, see, if I didn't learn how to listen about the sweetener when it comes to the real serious things, and, and, and he's, he's constantly testing me to see if I'm listening, right? Now, who's the test for? To see, for me to see whether I'm listening. Not him. He's trying to get me to see whether I'm listening. Now, if the righteousness of the law is going to be fulfilled within me, I have to walk in the Spirit. I have to walk in in the Holy Spirit, led and directed by Him. If I'm walking in the Spirit, then the Spirit is going to lead me to do two things to fulfill the law. God made all the law for one purpose. What did He make the earth for? He made it for one purpose, that we might have a loving relationship with Him and that we might have a loving relationship with each other. That was the only reason He made the earth that we might have loving relationship with him and loving relationship with each other. And man is really run amok about having loving relationship with God or having a loving relationship with each other. 
the whole law was built around the purpose of give me a planet that's full of where you love each other, where we're a family and can sit at the table and you're not throwing mashed potatoes at each other. <laughs> you know, the whole law was written. Let's just be a lovely family of treating each other with kindness and gentleness and care. And oh, you first. You, I love those two little squirrels. You know. Oh, no, no, I insist you. Oh, no. You know, and three hours later, they're still doing that. Like, those are Christian squirrels. <laughs> and then, go, God, show us how it's done. <laughs> they're almost irritating, aren't they? <laughs> because of their genuineness in that. Their genuineness of taking the fall to the other. We don't have that genuineness unless we somehow can get this love in us. So I think something we're going to have to examine, uh, if the law is fulfilled through love, then grace is amplified to us through that love, then it's something we need to acquire. So I think the big question is how? How do we, how do we get that? How do we? It's a good thing to know that, but what's the use of knowing that if we can't get that? If it's beyond our comprehension in here of obtaining something that is so valuable of a commodity, you realize if you were not guilty the freedom in Christ and in God you would have? Do you realize if you were not guilty the faith you would have in your Lord, your God? If you were not guilty, the desire to hear Him, the desire to be obedient, the desire of, oh God, Your will, Your will be done. What's Your will? We would just be running around just searching, what is Your will so I can do it? Right? So this matter of our lack of faith about Him dealing with our guilt, called grace, is an important matter in us that we don't realize that we have unbelief about what he has done and what he is doing and what he can do. We don't, we don't believe him. If we believe that, we'd be having a hallelujah party and move all the chairs and just be dancing and banging tambourines, which we'll get to that maybe here. He says all the law is, is uh, says, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Love does not harm its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Galatians 5 and 4, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's part of the problem. Love is not something that's mushy. Love is not something that is uh, emotional. Although, if we love God and have relationship with him, it will develop into strong affectionate, genuine heart ties that become emotional. But God's definition of love for Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world, but yet the world has hold of him like a wild cat. He, and, and the cat's ripping his arms off, and he says, Jesus is the one that's being torn to shreds. Did he say, I love you, man? Was he all mushy and... and, and and, and full of silt. and Because it, when we're emotional, we can shift. And we can shift. And, and there's, not, there's not any stability within us. If we're emotional, then we're going with our desires. We're, going, we're carried along by the wind. And we can be carried every different direction. And there's no, there's no formal standing. You know, what God's love is, Jesus coins for us, said, if you love me, obey me. <laughs> and that's expressed... Love is expressed in two ways. One, it's expressed in our immediate obedience. Our love to God is expressed in my, yes, Lord. Like he said with the sweetener, I just said, yes, Lord. He accepted that as an expression of love for me. If I would have said, can you explain that to me? Uh, I would have lost. I wouldn't have had a chance to express my love and obedience to him. Now, there's something else that love has to do with in our obedience. We must develop our obedience into love. 
So there's a development of this obedience into love. It turns into love. I used to be very obedient to my mother and to my father, and it's because I did not want to disappoint either one of them. I didn't want them to ever be disappointed in a report about me from school, from a neighbor, from friends, from another mother uh, of one of my friends. And not only that, I didn't want my mother or father to be disappointed in me holding up my part as a part of the family unit. If I could remember as a young child, I would try to make my bed. I'm sure it was not done very well. <laughs> you know how children are. I would try. As a young child, if my, my it got to the point with my mother and my father, especially my mother when I was very, very young, that she would put things out that I could play with and things I couldn't play with. And I wanted to be pleasing to her so much that whenever something was there, I would look at it and I would run over to it. I, I remember being a tot, you know, run over to it and be excited about it. But then I would look up to her and withdraw my hands until there was a, a look of joy, a look of joy. I was looking for the look of joy because I knew she had put something there for me to discover and explore. But there was also maybe something in the room that I shouldn't. But I learned to, to reach before I reached, right before I would look and see, where's her eyes, where's her heart? And if it wasn't supposed to, she'd go. It was a still a loving smile, but I knew, oh, I'm, that was not for me. And I would be, what is for me? See? I wasn't upset about it because that wasn't for me. I was looking, what is for me? Because she loved giving me mysteries. She used to take us on walks and hikes. And when, when I say walks and hikes, I'm talking, you know, tomboy style of finding some creek. And we went down through the creek and the water and, and brush. And we come back wet and leaves dripping off of us and limbs and branches and singing songs and dogs wagging their tails and oh, just having a marvelous time. Of course, you can't do that there in the northwest. It's too cold, but there in the south, it's a nice, refreshing thing to splash in water along the way in creeks and stuff. She was immersing me into those things I could do safely and those things that would be dangerous for me. She was teaching me. God, too, teaches us those things, so... Our obedience is a test of our love for God. It's, it's just a test. He was testing me about the sweetener. He was testing to see, well, I listen to the Spirit. Because if the Spirit simply spoke to me, no sweetener, no oatmeal, Curtis. Oh, yes, sir. Would that please you? And I didn't even have to ask if that would please him. I Sure. Just poured it in a bowl. Now, I could have been disgruntled with, oh, man, oatmeal without sweetener. That wouldn't have been pleasing to him, would it? There would have been an emotional reaction, and I would have lost my opportunity to bless him with my love through my obedience. You see how simple? I mean, we, we, if our children do that for us, it's a, it's a special blessing, isn't it? What's, what's not a special blessing is when they got a snide comment to make about everything we ask them to do. Or they change everything we ask them to do. Or they alter it in some way. I could have altered that. Well, how about three instead of six? See, I would have lost my opportunity to express my love towards my Lord. Now, we have this problem of how do we come into obedience unless God helps us, right? Now, there's, the, there's the thing. We can't do this on our own. If we couldn't keep the law before, how can we keep it now? unless we have help from God. And he has willing to liberally say that, uh, that he will help us. And uh, you've got a, passage, a couple of passages of Scripture. Uh, it says uh, in John, 1 John 2, 4, it says, One who says, I have come to know him, but does not keep his instructions. That person is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Who's the truth? Holy Spirit. 
spirit of truth, remember? The truth is not in him. So if we're not willing to obey that immediate command, that means the Holy Spirit, he's going to kind of step back from me. That doesn't mean I lose the capability of being a bearer of his presence. It means I have rejected his instruction. He can withdraw and not give me any instruction. If I'm not willing to listen, that's what he will do. It says, but he who keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. So if I want this love to enter me, and I begin to keep his word, now this is, this is presuming that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, and that you really want to do things his way, there's a presumption in there that you have gone along in your walk with God and you are either getting ready to receive the Spirit or have received the Holy Spirit. If you're in either one of those positions, you still can be led by the Spirit because you're not resistive to the Spirit. It's just more developmental processes for us. But it says, But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God, has truly been perfected. Now, wasn't that what I said that I needed to fulfill the law? The, the love? If I'm going to fulfill the law, then the love of God's going to be in me, but that love needs to be perfected. In other words, it needs to come from Him. And if I keep His instruction of uh, no six splendors in your oatmeal, Curtis, I, and, and I said, yes, Lord. Now, I kept His instruction. I kept His word. He spoke that word to me just as clear as a bell. It kind of startled me because he's never talked about me putting sweetener in oatmeal. You know, a few years ago, I was resistive about him saying, you know, you don't need three cups of sugar in your oatmeal. <laughs> you know, three to one, one cup of oatmeal, three cups of sugar. <laughs> oh, y'all y'all are two to one. I, I understand, you know. And I'm exaggerating, you know that. But if I keep his word, just a simple instruction, and I don't resist it, now there's going to be an impartation from the Spirit, because I listened to Him, of the love of God in me, something I didn't have, something I'm going to need, something I'm going to need during the day so that I can treat my wife with rightness, so I can treat my God with rightness, something that's going to love perfected, it, it, let me read that again. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. How do we know it? I said, yes, Lord, to the Splenda. He says, oh, I'm so pleased with you, Curtis. Here, just let me give you a big hug. And he surrounds me and he begins to speak to me. And it, his love his presence and His love does something. I have to sometimes really pray hard. And I say, Lord, my heart's a stone. I, I can't hear you. I'm, I'm a rock today. So, well, you were a rock yesterday too, Curtis, because you didn't listen. <laughs> I, and so I really pray, Lord, I need a heart that is soft towards you, that is soft towards I need I need your love because I get really crusty. Now Jackie probably would never tell you that I was crusty, but I occasionally I wake up and honey I'm crusty. And she, I know. <laughs> it was a surprise to her. <laughs> now if we're going to listen to his word, now this throws scripture in it too, does it not? Not the law, the scripture. 1 Timothy 3 and 16, all scriptures inspired by God, and it's profitable, profitable for teaching. What would I need teaching in? How to come into the love of God and obedience to Him. It's profitable for reproof. There again, the law that condemned me, now it can say, now see there, you, you know you weren't supposed to do that, and I, I, I told you that, and there it is in writing. Will you accept it now? See, there's a little reinforcement, a little reinforcement, not condemnation a reinforcement of what the Spirit told me not to eat that cup of sugar. Now, I see in the Scripture, and it's not in Scripture about that, but if it was in Scripture, I get the backup of it being in Scripture for reinforcement for me. And that helps me, doesn't it? 
Because the next time the Holy Spirit says, don't do that, or this is what I want you to do, then I say, oh, yes. It helps me in a sense, that reproof does, that I now know what it says, and oh, I'm I, sorry, I didn't do that the other day. I, I, I didn't listen to you. It's also for correction. Uh, correction. Uh, correction's real important. We look at it as a switch. God looks at us like we're standing on the edge of a cliff hanging off, you know. And he says, you need some correction. And he puts his arm around you and he pulls you. And he says, now come on, come away from the cliff. And we're screaming, but uh, what I want is there. <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. We need correction. He's trying to keep us from getting off in the deep end and going into darkness and depression and all the places of the enemy. But it's also, you remember, we were lacking righteousness, Right? The Scripture is also there for training in righteousness. The Scripture now, through the Spirit, what the law could not do to the external, the Spirit now can begin to write these things in my heart. The heart that is soft, the heart that had become and said yes to the Word, and because I said yes to the Word, the heart that the Lord comes and softens and makes pliable, now He, he, he begins to write the love notes in my heart from, from the Lord so that I become like a living epistle that can stand before Him and walk with Him and, and hear Him and ready to receive His instruction. Why? Because it brings righteousness. Do you know what it's like to feel like you've accomplished something for the living God? And righteousness is just poured out upon you. And the glory of God and His presence and His manifestation and, and the sweetness of His Spirit and the sweetness of, Oh, God, you're pleased. Have that sweep over your soul it's unbelievable, and it's worth seeking after. The experience is far beyond getting to go anywhere or do anything. It's far beyond any experience there is experiencing the glory of God. We're supposed to be going from glory to glory to glory. Now, we must be acquainted with Scripture. In Proverbs 6.23, it says, For the commandment, those Scriptures, is a lamp, and the law is the light. Whoa. <laughs> well, where's the law hanging? On the cross. So where's the light emanating from? From the cross. Because the law was hung on the cross with Jesus, with my nature. And that means if my nature's there, now the, uh, there's Jesus, took all my sin, he's hung on it, then the law is hung right over him. And now the light is emanating back this way, through Jesus, from Jesus, for me, saying, here's what I did. I took all your evil nature. I've got it on the cross. I want you to see it. I'm holding it for you. I know you think that you're a loser. I know that you think that these things won't leave you, but you're not under the dominion of the enemy. He has delivered us from the dominion of the enemy. He makes a statement in Proverbs 4 and 17, but the path of righteousness is like the light of the dawn. It shines brighter and brighter and brighter until the fullness of day shows up, until you're standing in the midst of the fullness of day. Isn't that what we want to walk in, in the fullness of day? Because in the fullness of day, that's where we see our Lord that's where His glory is revealed. That's where the heavenlies become known to us. The windows are open. The doors are open. The light is always supposed to be getting brighter for us. We have never arrived. Even when we make it into heaven, my goodness, we haven't even explored there. And for someone to think they've learned it all, they know it all, they've had all the experiences while they're standing right here. And the angels themselves have not experienced all the things of God. They wait to explore the heavens with us and see all the glories of God revealed to them. The mysteries have not been revealed to them and it's waiting to be revealed to us who are in Christ Jesus. Paul says he pressed towards that mark. What was the mark? It was an objective and a purpose of having that imputed righteousness from Jesus Christ resident at all times through the breath of the Holy Spirit. That was a mark that he was pressing for. Not the mark to make it into heaven. The mark that he would do it right, right now. The mark that that imputed righteousness gets transformed because of our working out our salvation with fear and trembling. 
You know what working out your salvation with fear and trembling means? It's a workout. <laughs> working out my salvation, what it means is when we first receive Jesus, and as long as we say yes to Him, as long as we say yes to the Holy Spirit, there's imputed righteousness. Now when I say yes to the Holy Spirit, I'm working out righteousness in my acts. My act of, I already had the splendor in my hand, six packages ready to rip the top off. And the Holy Spirit, don't use that today. Yes, sir. I put it right back in the bowl, nice and neat. My reaction to his imputed righteousness, you realize that when the Lord speaks, it's righteousness, right? When his word is righteousness, his word brings righteousness. My response to it now is an action that is an action of outworked righteousness. Do you understand the difference between the two? Because what the law could never do is get the people to do works of righteousness because it couldn't change the heart. There was no overflow. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth overflow. There was no overflow of righteousness. There was only the, in the law protecting them under the sacrifice. Jesus comes and he becomes a sacrifice. Now I've got something not only protecting me from the law that's done away with the law, but now I have something else. I have his imputed righteousness. And out of the midst of that, in First Peter or Second Peter 1 and 5, he says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence to your faith, Supply the character, the moral excellence. In your moral excellence, you need to supply knowledge, and to your knowledge, self-control, and to your self-control, perseverance, and to your perseverance, God-likeness or godliness. Now, see, we're not capable of doing those things unless we're listening and obeying the Spirit, but it starts with His imputed righteousness of him speaking to me, or me first receiving Jesus, he imputes, but there's a daily imputing, there's an hourly imputing, and that imputing comes as every time I say, what would your will be? Do you, see, I, I didn't ask about the Splenda. Tomorrow, when I have oats, I'm going to ask about the Splenda. Now, see, now that would be a further action on my part of yesterday, that's what you wanted. Is that what you want today, Lord? And now I'm taking the righteous act that he showed me that would be righteous. One more step of, I'm, I'm willing to do that again. Lord, is that what you want? Do you want this to be a permanent thing? See, I'm, I'm making right inquiries so that I can work out or have this outworking of righteousness flowing out of me. But there's no righteousness that can flow out of us without the leadership of the Spirit without our obedience to what he has to say, because we're in the law of the Spirit. And when we're listening to him, because I listen to his word, now he floods me with something I don't have. See, he's giving me the gift. One, he gave me the gift of speaking to me, his word. You can read that in Scripture, or you can hear it here, or you can do both. Two, because of my response, he now floods me with something I don't have, and that's love for him, and love for my fellow man. He's the one that can impart that to you so that your actions begin to want to fulfill what pleases him, just like I wanted to fulfill what pleases my mother. Now, God is interested in this worked-out righteousness. So in Philippians 2 and 12 and 15, he says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but as much more in my absence, work out this salvation with fear and trembling. That was the workout that I told you a minute ago. For it is God who is at work in you. Who's at work in you? God is. To both to will and to work for his good pleasure. One translation is to will and to do. The problem is sometimes... We want to do it, but we don't have the will to make ourselves to do it. But yet, if we do it through the Spirit and are listening to Him, He's going to supply 
both of those needs so that we can accomplish it. Accomplish it. And then, then he finishes that. He said, now be sure and everything he asks you to do, do it without grumbling or disputing. <laughs> Why did he have to throw that in? <laughs> did he know us? Did he know our character? And he said, so that you'll prove yourselves to be blameless, innocent children of God. When I'm blameless inside, oh, it gives me such joy. Then he says in verse 7, he said, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. This is Revelation 19, I think, in 19 or 19 and 8, something like that. 19 and 7. And in it, it says, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. The bride, here's the end result, was given clothing that was white, fine linen. And then it says, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. I'm taking you all the way to the end and showing you our wedding garment. It's the outworked righteousness of listening to the Spirit, what the Spirit has to say right now. There's linen garments being laid up for me for that special occasion that are white and spotless and stainless just because I will listen to God himself. Now, grace only operates through the death of Christ. Without his death and the cross, there is no grace for Romans 8 and 3, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful nature. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk at, not after the flesh, but after the Holy Spirit. Now, how is the righteousness of the law fulfilled within us? By accepting him on the cross, and that's where my flesh is. And how's the righteousness worked within me? By accepting, I'm going to do it and listen to the Holy Spirit. Now, Christ did five things that we need to know inside. You need to really write this in your heart. He paid the penalty for our past sins. Next time you think you've got to pay the penalty, you don't have enough funds to do that. He's the one that said, come and buy from me pure gold. Why? Because he can afford it. What do I have to give him? Myself and saying, here I am, Lord, I'm yours. It's the only thing I can sell him, right? If I don't own anything, you just got through telling me in the book of Revelation, third chapter, that I'm blind, that I'm naked, that I'm stupid, that I, <laughs> that I don't have anything, I'm poor, I'm wretched, and he, you know, there's a few other connotations in the Greek in there. And, and then he says, come and buy from me. The only thing I have, I can sell myself to him. Now, that's not a concept that we as Americans understand. It's a concept that's still known in other nations. If you don't have anything, you're starving to death, your kids are dying, your wife is dying, and you want to at least survive, you can go sell yourself into slavery in some places still in the world. You're actually selling a commodity, and God looks at us as a commodity to become a slave, then in that slavery become his sons and daughters by being obedient to him. Now, here's something we want to get to. Is in Romans, if he paid the penalty for the past sin, having in, in Romans 3 and 23 through 26, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? What's the glory? Isn't that his living presence? Huh? His Shekinah presence, glory? Being justified as a gift of his grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a perpetuation. I'm going to stop there for just a minute. I told you earlier that the mercy seat was, in the Greek, the Hebrew translation for the mercy seat was perpetuation. Why? Because blood would be brought in and sprinkled on that mercy seat. God would accept that sacrifice and he would do away with it. What was the most mercy seat covering? It was covering the ark. The ark is the type of us. The ark, what was in the ark? The law. 
God, as a matter of fact, God calls it His testimony. His testimony was in there. The testimony that was broken is in there. The law is in there. And the mercy seat's covering it. The broken law, the mercy seat's covering. And you know what the penalty of the law was if you opened up and moved the mercy seat and you looked into it? The penalty was death. It was forbidden for anybody to look into the broken law. It was covered by the mercy seat. And Jesus, Him being the perpetuation of our relational functionality with God, of Him dying, saying, I did it. I took everything about your nature. I took all that there was. I took your rebellion. I took your slime. I took all of it, everything that you is, And I took it to the cross, and I've set you free, and I've delivered you from the kingdom of darkness, and I've set up a kingdom of light for you, and I'm bringing you into that. I'm covering it. I'm putting myself over the law, and I tell you, you can't look back into the past because I paid for it. There's the types and there's the shadows. If it was forbidden for us to look at the broken law that was in there, it's forbidden for us to look at the laws that we break in our past. If we belong to Jesus Christ and if we truly trust Him that He's covering it. Now the problem with the past is we think that was yesterday. Now, how many of you committed a sin today? Let's see your hands. Come on now, come on. (laughs) How long ago was that? You don't have to tell me. When right now, what this second was it? Come on, was it? Was it right this second? Then that means it was in the past. And what did Jesus die for? All our past sins. It's in the past. If it's repentant and we ask for forgiveness, it's in the past. It's paid for completely. So is there anything that is in the past that when we come to church, that that's why it's important. That's why I try to lead you in prayers of, oh, God, forgive me. Why instantly it's stuffed into the law, the lid's put on it, and it doesn't apply anymore. And by the law, we can't even look at it and say it does. Why? Because Jesus is at perpetuation for that. He gave us life for that. And we don't count it as enough value. We don't shout, hallelujah, oh, praise God, I'm set free. Why? Because we want to believe what the enemy says, you're still guilty. Jesus did something else. Number two, he terminated the law as a means of righteousness. You find that in Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. I added the Jesus Christ on there. Number three, he settled all claims against us. Do you realize there was, there's claims against you? That's the problem. The enemy comes and says there's a claim against you. You know what you said. You know what you did. There's a claim against you. Colossians 1, 12 and 13. Give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, for He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and translated us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Do you get that? There were two guys in the Old Testament who were translated. Who was that? Enoch and Elijah. And they were truly translated into another kingdom, were they not? And if God is speaking this, if Jesus Christ is laying this on the table, He said, you need to be rejoicing right now. I have translated you out from under the dominion of darkness. You do not belong to Him anymore. And I have put you into my kingdom of light. And we don't believe that, because if we believe that, we'd be shouting hallelujah and dancing and jumping up and down and building campfires and praising God and, and, and filled with joy. There's a problem. We have unbelief in us of what He's accomplished. Number three, He put away sin. All sin. You have sin. You just confess to me, do you, you dirty sinners? <laughs> Colossians two thirteen through 15 When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him. Do you believe Him? I mean, we're looking at our flesh, and I don't believe you. I still own it. No, you don't. He owns it. He pays the price for it. He owns it. Satan has lied to me and I believe him and I'd rather repeat what the enemy has to say that I'm 100% guilty when he says your transgressions and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us of all of our transgressions. All of them. 
are you getting this? This is pretty serious, isn't it? Because we don't believe this. If we believe this, we would not be guilty. With us just saying, oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, I repent. I don't want to do that. Do you believe him that he said, I'm going to take every one of your transgressions. I'm going to wipe it off the road map of your past, and you can't look in the box. I'm the perpetuation. And when we pry the lid off that thing and look in the box, aren't we good as dead when we look at our past transgressions? <laughs> we believe Satan. There's no way God can accept me now. He, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of the decrees of the law which were against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When in he had disarmed the rulers and authority, he made a public display and spectacle of them, having triumphed over them through him. He gave us freedom. Remember, you know, Satan was lined up as a public spectacle. He was stripped of all of his power. He never regained his power. So why do we give it to him in our guilt, in our shame? Jesus bore our shame too and took it to the throne of God and said, I'm filled with shame. Father says, I, I see that, son. Thank you for bringing it. Now take your seat. He was the bludgeoned, bloody lamb filled with the shame of us sitting on a throne next to God so that God could look upon it and forgive it and get rid of it. And yet we want to believe Satan when he says, you're guilty. We don't want to believe Jesus. If you belong to Him, you need to call Satan. You're a liar. Yes, I have fallen and will continue, but Jesus has covered it. And I am set free from your dominion. And I will be free from your dominion. And He's given me a different kingdom to live in. He's given me a different identity. And I won't believe the identity that you keep trying to pin to me. That's supposed to be deep within our soul of resisting that identity that the enemy wants to give us. I want to finish by giving you something in, in Romans. I'll have to put my glasses on. I looked it up right before. For those God foreknew, He also predestinated to go to heaven. Is that what it says? For those God foreknew, He also predestinated to sit on thrones. Is that what it says? For those God foreknew, He also predestinated to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. Do you believe Him or you not believe Him? And then when I'm not conformed there, I'm conformed here. Regardless of my thought process, regardless of whatever is taking place, if I will only listen to the Spirit and say, yes, I will do that. Or if I say, I don't have the power to do that, will you help me do that? If I just will listen to Him, He will fill and do something in my heart. And He will cause faith to come in me. And He will cause something to happen within me where I will both do it and I want to do it. That's the problem. The law can never make me want to do it, but the Spirit, it can make me, oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. So He's predestined you to be conformed into the likeness of Him right here that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. And those he predestinated, he also called. And those he called, he justified. Justified means he's made you righteous. Are you righteous? Come on, answer me. Are you righteous? And why? It's because of him. It's because of him. Every day we get up, we should be shouting and celebrating. Oh, Jesus, thank you. You have made me righteous. I accept your righteousness. And if I accept his righteousness, now I don't get under the thumb of the enemy and tell me what a miserable wretch I am and I'll never make it. And he, God could never, he just didn't understand the, the, the logistics of the big project of my failures. Jesus Christ has not failed. He is the one that is imputing righteousness. There is no righteous thing within me. There never will be. 
that because of the imputed righteousness of him being in here, I say yes to the Spirit. As a, rework, as, a, as a reward of that, something happens in my heart. And when that happens within my heart, the outflow of righteousness of me fulfilling the law by my acts begin to take place by his power, not by mine. By his might, not by mine. By his deliverance, not by mine. Through his joy and through his peace and through his continence, his character is being worked within me if I would just cooperate with him in a simple manner of saying, yes, Holy Spirit. No splendor in my oatmeal, thank you. <laughs> it's that simple. No splendor in my oatmeal, thank you. Shall we pray? And I thank you for the simplicity of your grace that surrounds us. Forgive us for not believing that you've taken our sin, our current sin, away. Forgive us for not believing that you will conform us to your your image. Oh, help us believe, Lord, that you are conforming us to your image. That the enemy is not winning, but you are. And that you will finish the good work that you have started within us. How glorious you are, Lord. Stir us up in our most holy faith that we believe, that we can believe and will believe. That you have done these things, past tense which covers also our future. We love you, Lord. How we thank you. Excitedly, thank you. For separating us from that which we could never escape. How we thank you for giving us invitation to come into your kingdom of life. Help us see it now. In Jesus' great and powerful and precious name, I pray. Amen.